People always say to me, man, Chappelle's show looked like a blast. Was it fun? It wasn't. <laughs> it wasn't fun at all. It was hard. We'd have to stay awake for 48 hours at a time just to keep up with the schedule. We were bombed out and depleted. We were lumped up. We both had erectile dysfunction. <laughs> I told Dave about mine, and he goes, it's because we're using laptops too much, man. <laughs> and, then, and then he goes, plus, we're not as young as we used to be. Meanwhile, there's no causal link between laptop use and erectile dysfunction. And also, we were 29. <laughs> Dave Chappelle completely transformed my life. He lent me $1,000 so I could move to L.A. He asked me to write a movie with him when I had zero experience. Dave Chappelle believed in me at a time when absolutely nobody did. You know how we all have a friend who will hit us up out of the blue sometimes for something funny? Imagine what his texts and phone calls are like. <laughs> One time he called me on a Tuesday afternoon and he goes, hey man, I just finished watching 12 Years a Slave. Anyhow, you think slaves ever whip their kids? On a Tuesday afternoon. <laughs> In closing, if you remember only one thing from my speech tonight, I hope that its Chappelle show was not fun. <laughs> but it was great, and it will be near impossible to beat, and it's because of that guy right there. It's been fucking wonderful. I don't know what to say, man. I don't even want this night to end. I promise you, whoever cares the most, I care at least as much as them. I know what I got, because I lost it all. I got to tell you something. And I don't talk about it often. Have you ever worked all your life for something and have it not work out? Yeah. That happened to me. It was tough. Think about it. I was gone for 12 years. It's not a little bit of time. It was hell. I watched other niggas that I knew become very famous. I watched the world go on without me. I mourned the loss of it, and after a while, I didn't care. Coming back was terrifying. I understand what I am. I really do, more than anybody. Like, when they write about me in history, I'll, I'll be dead reading it like, yeah, I know they'd say that. <laughs> they say that a person can't dream of a face they've never seen can't believe that's true, but it's probably true. Boy, I got a long bank of faces. 32 years, I could close my eyes, I could think of any night, there's so many faces. Every night, most nights, they're all looking up, smiling. <laughs> you have no idea what the world looks like from that. All different races, all different colors, all different kind of beliefs, just looking at me, smiling for 32 years, night after night. <sighs> <laughs> no comedian take that for granted. I swear to God, this might be the noblest of professions. Robin Williams had a bar that I loved. He said, comedy is the only job you can have where you can use everything you know. And that's true. You can use more than you know. You can use what you think. Use it. Don't be afraid. Don't let these bitch ass niggas button your lip. <laughs> Say it anyway. If you're at home watching, not knowing what to make of this because you haven't checked Twitter yet to see how you feel, <laughs> um, you can. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the incomparable John Legend.
Not only am I a big fan of Dave's, but I grew up in Springfield, Ohio. A yes. About 15 minutes away from where Dave lives now and spent a lot of his childhood. I know we're in D.C., and he spent a lot of time here, too. But Dave is from Ohio, okay? <laughs> We're claiming him. Most of the outstanding bold-faced names from Ohio become famous after they leave Ohio. <laughs> One could argue they have to leave Ohio to succeed. <laughs> but amazingly, Dave still lives in the Buckeye State. <laughs> he still lives in the kind of town that makes people wonder, why does Dave Chappelle live in that town? <laughs> he lives in the so-called forgotten America. Dave never forgot about it. He has brought the world to Ohio. His annual musical jam sessions on a local farm are legendary. He's brought some of the greatest talents in the world together to celebrate life there. And recently, after the mass shooting in Dayton, to bring comfort after tragedy. And of course, the most iconic and unforgettable jam session that will go down in history was back in 2005. He took a group from his hometown in Ohio, including students from our local historically black university, Central State, on a bus to Brooklyn. Yes. And when they got to Brooklyn, what an amazing pop culture moment Dave created. He brought together some of the most important hip hop and neo soul artists in the world for an epic concert that blended Dave's comedy and his impeccable taste in music. Comedians and musicians were like this. Every comic wants to be a musician. Every musician thinks they're funny. You mother got three titties, one for milk, one for water, and the other one is out of order. Hit me! All these people that are coming to this concert, before I ever met them, I was fans of theirs. So to work with these people in this kind of setting, it's a dream come true. This is the concert I've always wanted to see. Huh? Well, if this take away from my spears, would you probably take, take away from my ears? ears? Then I hope it take away from my sins and bring the day that I dream about. We shook up the world! How y'all doing? My name is Q-Tip. Uh, I am proud to be the uh, artistic creative director of hip hop here at the Kennedy Center. I want to talk to my bro, my friend. You my brother. I love you. I've known this dude since he first started, and it was 1992 or three, and he came on the bus, and he's like, hi, ah, I'm Dave Chappelle. I was like, yo, you're Dave Chappelle. I know who you are. I saw Robin Hood Men in Tights. And I'm probably the only rapper that was watching Mel Brooks back then. <laughs> I bought Dave his first suit at when he did Letterman in 1995. Wow. Might have been 94. I took him to Barney's with my cousin. Wow. He was still wearing um, cross colors. <laughs> <laughs> now don't tense up for me. I want you guys to think I'm like an angry black guy. I mean, I am an angry black guy, but you know what I mean? I have a right to be an angry black guy, though. It's different for me. See, I don't know if you guys believe in reincarnation or not, but I have been black four lives in a row. <laughs> I need a break. <laughs> but I figured, fuck, it's better me than some kid. <laughs> I might as well roll the dice and go pick my nigga up. I said, all right, I'm coming to get you. Just give me the address and I'll be right there. And then he gave me the address, and I was, I was shocked. I said, son, you are not going to believe this, but I'm at the same party, nigga.
They grow up fast, don't they? Can I ask you a weird question? I don't want to make you feel uncomfortable. You don't have to answer it, and if it doesn't go well, we'll just edit it out anyway. <laughs> Is it weird to be the only white people in a row? <laughs> Is it weird? I mean, to be honest, does it feel strange? Are you worried at all? <laughs> Give me your money, motherfucker. I'm just fucking around. Right. <laughs> this guy got ice in his veins. He didn't even buckle. You know, like many black men my age, the first time I voted was eight years ago. <laughs> right. I saw Obama on TV, I said, oh, I'm voting for this nigga. <laughs> I remember the day I voted for Obama. I voted in Ohio, and my vote matters in Ohio. Ohio is a battleground state, but when I pulled up to the polls, all the soldiers were in line. There were so many black people in that goddamn line, I didn't even know it was the polls. I thought it was a check cashing place. <laughs> we were hugging each other, and old people were singing hymns and spirituals and shit. It was like uh, the O.J. Verdict times 10 or some shit. I've never seen black people that happen. Eight years later, I'm pulling up to the polls again. This time, I'm driving a brand new Porsche because the Obama years were very good to me. <laughs> I was early voting, and when I parked my car, I figured out something that it would take the rest of the country another week to figure out. I understood that Donald Trump was gonna be our next president because in Ohio, unlike D.C., you could see the results in the parking lot. So all these goddamn pickup trucks and tractors and shit. <laughs> and then I walked up and I saw a long, long line of dusty white people. <laughs> yes, ladies and gentlemen, these were the poor whites. And I must tell you, I've never had a problem with white people ever in my life. But full disclosure, the poor whites are my least favorites. <laughs> We've gotten a lot of trouble out of them. And I'd never seen so many of them up close. <laughs> I looked them right in their coal-smeared faces. <laughs> and to my surprise, you know what I didn't see? I didn't see one deplorable face in that group. I saw some angry faces and some determined faces, but they felt like decent folk. No, they did, in fact, I'm not even lying, and I didn't sound fucked up, but I felt sorry for them. I know the game now. I know that rich white people call poor white people trash. And the only reason I know that is because I made so much money last year, the rich whites told me they say it at a cocktail party. <laughs> and I'm not with that shit. And I stood with them in line, like all of us Americans are required to do in a democracy. Nobody skips the line to vote. And I listened to them. I listened to them say naive, poor white people things. <laughs> Man, Donald Trump's gonna go to Washington and he's gonna fight for us. <laughs> I'm standing there thinking to my mind, you dumb motherfucker. <laughs> You are poor. <laughs> He's fighting for me. <laughs> and they all looked at me. They could tell who I was voting for just as easily as I could tell who they were voting for. But do you guys know what we all had in common? Not one of us, not a single one of us, Looked like we felt good about what we had to do in that booth. <laughs> we were just doing our goddamn duty. Yes, I voted for Hillary Clinton. Of course I did. 
I voted for her because I liked what she said vastly better than I liked what he said. But to be honest with you, at that point, that shit was like watching Darth Vader do the I Have a Dream speech. <laughs> that bitch is mean as hell. She had already karate kid swept Bernie Sanders' legs from underneath him. Boy, it was hard voting for that shit. <laughs> but that, it was the lesser of the evils. I know you were a Clinton supporter, Miss I. am sorry to say like that. It didn't feel bad voting for her, but it didn't feel as good as it should have. She was gonna be our first woman president. They were gonna make coins out of this bitch. <laughs> and somehow she just missed the dunk. <laughs> of course she should have beat him. Of course she should have beat him. You know what voting for her felt like? It was bittersweet. It felt like I was lucky enough to eat Halle Berry's pussy. And whilst I was doing so, she fucking farted in my face, man. <laughs> now, you understand, I'd still do it. <laughs> but boy, I wish she didn't fart in this great nation's face. <laughs> I voted that day, and then that same day, I flew to New York City. I had work. That night I was in a comedy club in New York and I said to an audience almost exactly what I just said to you. And I didn't know that there was a journalist in the room. And this journalist wrote an article. The headline of the article said, Dave Chappelle is an avid Donald Trump supporter. <laughs> yeah, I had no idea the paper said that. And you know how I found out? My wife called me from Ohio the next morning in a goddamn panic. David, David, what the fuck <laughs> is going on in New York? I said, I'm being good, but what have you heard? <laughs> and my wife said, the paper is saying that you're a Donald Trump supporter. I was like, whew. I said, don't worry about that shit, baby. <laughs> Nobody in their right mind would believe that. And she said, no, David, people believe it. And then she started reading the comments to me. Oh, they were terrible. All these black people calling me all kinds of Uncle Toms and shit. <laughs> I should tell you, buddy, this is a very serious allegation from one black to another. <laughs> I was incensed. Uncle Tom! How am I Uncle Tom, nigga? You the one that reads The Observer. <laughs> anyway, all this shit goes down. And uh, Saturday night rolls around, and now Trump is the president, and I'm hosting Saturday Night Live. And I didn't really like prepare my monologue, I just kind of winged it. <laughs> and at the end of the monologue, I don't even remember what I said. I said something like, you know, fuck it, like we're uh, historically disenfranchised and we're gonna give him, something about we're gonna give him a chance if he gives us a chance. I don't know what I said, but whatever I said, I, I really wish I didn't say that shit. <laughs> it was not worth the trouble. <laughs> now I walk into the barber shop and all them black people just be looking at me like, yo, Dave, what's up with your boy? Yo, nigga, yo! <laughs> Not my boy. Because I don't care if you're a Republican or Democrat, if you support him or not, any objective person is gonna have to admit that uh, this motherfucker is having a terrible go of it. <laughs> you know, I'm not a pedophile. But if I was, <laughs> Macaulay Calkins the first kid I'm fucking, I'll tell you that right now. <laughs> I'd be a goddamn hero. Hey, that guy over there fucked the kid from Home Alone. And you know how hard he is to catch.
My mind's telling me no. <laughs> well, okay, R. Kelly is different. <laughs> I mean, you know, if I'm a betting man, I'm gonna put my money on, he probably did that shit. <laughs> I'm pretty sure he did that shit. <laughs> you know, it was bad, okay, so a couple years ago, I was doing a show in Detroit, and I'm sitting backstage in my dressing room, a friend of mine comes by, this chick, Dream Hampton. Dream uh, tells me, right before I'm going on stage, she goes, Dave, I'm working on a documentary on, about R. Kelly. Would you like to be in it? And I was like, nah, bitch, I'm cool. I went on stage, I just forgot about the shit. And then two years later, the documentary comes out, Surviving R. Kelly. And when it comes out, Dream's promoting the shit, and she keeps bringing me up. She said, I asked Dave Chappelle to be in my documentary, and he said it was too hot for TV. Bitch, I did not say that. <laughs> it does not even sound like how I talk. Oh, that's too hot for TV? I would never say that shit. But I'm gonna tell you guys why I wasn't in the documentary. It's a very simple reason, and uh, I cannot stress this point enough. The only reason that I didn't do it was because, and it's very important, I don't know this nigga at all. <laughs> I don't know anything. I don't know anything that they don't tell me about. I don't hang out with this nigga, nothing. So what the fuck do I gotta be in the documentary for? <laughs> this guy, R. Kelly, got another sex tape out now. Can you believe that shit? This guy makes more sex tapes than he does music. <laughs> He's like the DJ Khaled of sex tapes. <laughs> another one. Like, damn, nigga. Like... <laughs> it's a lot of tapes. <laughs> the new one's so bad that they didn't even show it. I've never seen anything like this. The prosecutor in Chicago came out in a press conference and read to the media a transcript of a sex tape. Have you ever heard of such a thing? This nigga read the sex tape. And it was so bad that R. Kelly sounded guilty in the transcripts. It's fucking amazing. 16 times the girl's age was mentioned. Isn't that crazy? This motherfucker is an idiot. He was fucking her like, yeah, this is the best 14-year-old pussy I've ever had in my life. And she was like, you like this 14-year-old pussy? He's like, oh, yeah, I love this 14-year-old. I'm like, man, you need to shut the fuck up. You got to give your lawyer something to work with. You're supposed to be on the tape like, this is the best 36-year-old pussy I've ever had in my life. And then your lawyer going to be like, your honor, clearly my client thought that this woman was 36 as he mentioned some 16 times in the tape. <laughs> they gonna know you lying, though, you know what I mean? Everybody knows no such thing as good 36-year-old pussy. <laughs> Doesn't matter what I say. And if you at home watching this shit on Netflix, remember, bitch, you clicked on my face. <laughs> you say, well, what's the problem with that? I said, well, the problem, sir, is that our hero is not, uh, he's not a handsome man. <laughs> and he's often short on cash. So whenever trouble breaks out, he has to run around the city and convince women to let him pat their vaginas. Please, miss, that building's on fire. Can I pat your vagina quickly? People are dying, but he can't tell them exactly why. Ugh, get away, you're gross. Please, miss, people are dying. Just a couple of pats. Ugh, gross, get away. <laughs> so he rapes them. I know, I know. That's 
the dilemma for the audience. Because he rapes, but he saves a lot of lives. And he saves way more than he rapes, and he only rapes to save. But he does rape. <laughs> I didn't realize it, but the whole green room was looking at us. All the celebrities were disgusted. <sighs> that guy from Texas was like, here's my card, call me on Monday. <laughs> that worked out. The second time I met O.J. Simpson. <laughs> was right after the trial of the century. There I was, now a young man of probably 23. O.J. Simpson was the most famous or infamous face on planet Earth. I was in a restaurant in Beverly Hills with my agents. I wasn't alone in the restaurant, but I was alone. I was the only black person in the restaurant. <laughs> and in the 90s, that felt very uncomfortable. Now I tend to enjoy it at this age. I was having dinner with my agents, celebrating a deal that they told me was lucrative, but I later learned fucking sucked. <laughs> and suddenly, a group of women walked by. Every race was in that group. Black, white, Asian, Latina, white, white, <laughs> and white again. They were all gorgeous. I watched them walk by. Then, I saw a familiar face. Al Collins, the man from the infamous Bronco Chase, walked by and embraced one of the women, and they walked towards the door. Couldn't believe what I saw. And then, close behind him, was O.J. Simpson, newly released from jail. The restaurant fell still. I was shocked. I didn't mean to say it out loud, but it just came out. <gasps> O.J. <laughs> he stopped. Turned around to see who said it. Saw my black face and correctly assumed it was me. I was sitting in the corner of the booth. He leaned over all the white people I was having dinner with and shook my hand. How are you, young man? He looked in my eyes and I could see in his eyes that he didn't remember meeting me the first time. <laughs> and then he walked away. And I looked back at my agents and all of them had nothing short of disgust on their faces. And the only one with the courage to voice their disgust was a woman named Sharon who used to represent me. How could you, she said. How could you shake hands with that murderer? I said, Sharon, with all due respect, that murderer ran for over 11,000 yards. <laughs> and he was acquitted, so, you know, fuck it. Glove didn't fit. Glove didn't fit. Get over yourself. <laughs> Some people can't do that. Some people just can't, they can't get over themselves. Gay people have a hard time doing that recently. Here we go, here comes the deep water. <laughs> no, recently I've noticed that. I noticed that uh, with that Manny Pacquiao controversy. Yeah, no, it was now, now in the gay community's defense, uh, Manny Pacquiao said some outlandish shit about gay people. Very, very not nice things that I won't repeat, but there was biblical verses and some analogies to animals. It wasn't a good look. Nike took his shoes immediately, which I thought was a little harsh. A little harsh. You know what I mean? Because he's, uh, just because he's Asian. You know what I mean? Fuck, you gonna take shoes off Asian dude to appease a gay dude, you know what I mean? No, you don't know what I mean, but Asian people kind of know what I mean, no? No Asians in the front, no? No, this is what I mean, okay, look, okay, you're an Asian dude, no, I, don't, I say this with no disrespect, but we're all Americans, right? And we can agree that America has a huge body count all over the world, but nowhere more than Asia. Literally, if you look at history, recently, we have bombed the masculinity out of an entire continent. We dropped two atomic bombs on fucking Japan and they've been drawing Hello Kitty and shit ever since. 
There's a lot of lady boys in the wake of our bumps. And I know these things because my wife is Asian. She's Filipino. All right, well, okay, so that explains it. Now you know why you see me at all those Filipino events. I'm not there picking up pussy, I'm dropping some off. I take my wife to all that shit. I took my wife to see Pacquiao fight Mayweather. We sat ringside, okay? That, yeah, that was a quiet car ride home. That's what that was. But if you know what's popping in the Philippines, you know that they got a whole generation of kids in the Philippines growing up without their mothers. Yes, a lot of women in the Philippines go to the Arabian Peninsula, they come to the United States, they make all their money here, all their money back home. This is still one of the number one states in the Philippines economy. One of the biggest places. Back to the Must have had some kind of gay political argument. The last one was about a, a petition in federal court to take the words husband and wife out of the law. I said, well, why would you want those words out the law? He said, because it discriminates against same-sex couples. I was like, niggas, please save me the semantics. Just trust me, take your chips and get the fuck out of the casino. You're about to crap out. Let's <laughs> go outside, talk that over amongst yourselves, and whichever one of you is gayer, that's the wife. No, 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 Stuart didn't like that. Stuart educates me about this movement, you know what I mean? I didn't even know shit about it. He told me it's called L-B-G-T-Q. I was like, what the fuck is the Q? Does that even make sense, Q? Turns out Q is like the vowels. That shit is sometimes why. For gay dudes that don't really know they're gay. You know what I mean? Like prison fags who are like, well, I'm not gay, nigga. I'm just sucking these dicks to pass the time. <laughs> I'm not G, I'm Q. Ugh. <laughs> 